Okay. So previous, uh, previously, we've sort of taken uh, sensory systems. We've sort of looked at those in groups, right? We've kind of lumped this stuff together. We've talked about the body senses. We've talked about four or five things. We've talked about chemical senses. We talked about a couple things there. Uh, this is sort of the start of that slowdown process, right? We're going to spend some time thinking about uh, the auditory system. One of the nice things about the auditory system is some of the more complicated and abstract uh, concepts that you're going to learn over the next couple weeks will carry those forward into uh, studying vision, right? So we'll think about those going forward. So if you don't, uh, at the end of the next couple days, quite understand what Fourier analysis is, uh, you know, you're not just like walking around deconstructing sine waves for fun, uh, don't worry about it. We'll pick up on uh, that as we go, okay? So we'll try to try to get a few things going. All right. So today we are going to talk. We are going to talk a little bit about physics of biology, uh, and physics and biology of audition. Okay? All right. Learning objectives. You don't have to worry too much about that. All right. So let's think about the stimulus itself, right? Let's think about sound waves. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, you do hear sound waves. I know that was, uh, you know, kind of like shock number one of the day, right? So we really want to start start slow. Uh, how does this work? Sound is uh, it's these pressure waves, right? And they're vibrating air molecules typically is what we think about. Uh, you can vibrate other molecules as well, but uh, if any of you have ever tried to like listen through a door or the wall or, uh, you know, I don't know, a titanium helmet, whatever it is, I don't know what you do with your spare time, right? I'm just thinking of random things you might do. Uh, you, can, you can think about how difficult that is, right? Uh, our auditory system is specifically tuned to, uh, to pick up on sound waves as they travel through air. Uh, this typically happens at about 335 uh, meters per second, right, is how fast this goes. This is pretty fast. Uh, at this point in the semester, I am required uh, to mention uh, Chuck Yeager. It's, uh, it's in my contract, uh, right? Why would I have to mention Chuck Yeager at this point? Anybody know? randomly during week four, you have to mention Chuck Yeager. Uh, he's the first person to break the sound barrier. So he's the first person to travel uh, faster than this 335 meters per second, right? Uh, so that's, that's moving pretty fast. Uh, sometimes we refer to that as Mach 1, right? Anybody know Chuck Yeager? Or not personally necessarily, but aware of Chuck Yeager as a like person? OK, great. It's one person. Yeah, he was the first person to break the sound barrier, uh, and he did that in his, uh, you know, wonderful uh, airplane, the the Bell X One, it's an experimental aircraft. You could watch the movie The Right Stuff, right? I think he's, he's sort of in that movie. Anybody seen that one, Andrew? You look like a guy who's seen that one. It's about astronauts. Ed Harris is in it. Uh, you know, right? It's worthwhile. All right, so uh, <clears throat> sound wave, right? There are two parts to the sound wave. There's a compression and there's a refraction. So basically, you sort of increase air pressure and then you decrease air pressure over space, right? And that travels you know, from one location to another. Okay. <clears throat> if we're thinking about a simple sort of uh, sound wave, it's got a few parts to it, right? It's got what we call a peak, and it's got a trough. Okay. That's the highest and lowest pressure points for that sign or for that sound wave, right? Now that sound wave is going to repeat over and over and over again, assuming that this is what we call a simple sound, which is just going to be made of sort of one uh, sine wave that just, you know, nice and smooth kind of repeats. Okay. If we want to measure something called the cycle, right, we can measure peak to peak. Uh, you could also measure trough to trough. It's the same distance, right? That's one cycle. What's going to be important for us is the, uh, the frequency of that sound, right? So how many cycles, right, how many cycles are traveling past a given point uh, in one second? That's typically how we measure that. We're going to measure that in something called hertz talk a little bit more about Hertz in a few moments. Okay. 
So how fast is this? Uh, not how fast is the sound wave moving, but how fast or how close together are these peaks and troughs, right? And that makes a difference in the sound itself. So uh, a sound that we would describe as a lower uh, pitched sound, really nice. It has a lower uh, frequency, right? So those two things go together. Lower frequency, uh, lower pitch. Higher frequency, higher pitch. Okay. Questions about this so far? If we want to think about amplitude, and we'll think about amplitude uh, later and uh, a bit more next week, we'll talk about amplitude and um, perception of loudness. Right? Amplitude is going from that kind of zero uh, point up or down, right? How far is the peak or trough from that, from that zero point? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's throw out a few more uh, terms and phrases here. Uh, we do want to think about a sine wave, right? You guys familiar with sine, cosine, and tangent, those three buttons on your calculator, you don't know what they do, uh, right? So sine wave is just a way that we describe the shape of, of a wave over time, right? Over some space. When we're thinking about sound waves, it's, it's a bit easier for us to think about these in terms of a sine wave, even though in fact they, there might be some variations to that. In a few moments we're going to get into the concept of um, Fourier analysis, right? and we're going to try to build complex sounds made from simple sine waves. So basically everything that you hear can be deconstructed into these simple sine waves, right? Anybody here, uh, I mean, if you're aware of like harmonics, anybody, anybody think about harmonics? Who's a, who, who, are, who are the musicians? That was very tentative. You were very like, maybe I am. Uh, so sometimes you think about harmonics these are, uh, we'll talk about them more later, but they're ways that you can break down those sine waves, right? There are those complicated sound waves into simple sine waves and how they kind of work in a, in a mathematical sense, okay? All right. Uh, so we talked about frequency already. We said that's measured in hertz, right? Again, this is going to be cycles per second. So that's peak to peak, right? How many of those peaks are coming by uh, per second? Okay, how many of you have jammed? Do you have sort of this situation? Or do you have this situation? Okay. Next we have amplitude. Typically we measure this in decibels, right? Okay. And it's a, it's a sound pressure. Uh, decibel scale is typically logarithmic. Logarithmic scales are also like your, uh, your Richter scale for earthquakes, right? Okay, so there's a big difference between a 1 and a 2, and in fact there's a bigger difference between a 2 and a 3 than there was a 1 and a 2, right? Because things keep getting bigger as you go. The next thing we want to think about is phase. Okay? Phase is going to be how we align the peaks and the troughs, right? So if something is in sort of perfect phase, you're going to have a sine wave, and then you would have another sine wave, that would just go right on top of that, right? Okay. If something is uh, what we would call out of phase or it's shifted in some way, your um, peaks and troughs are going to be in different locations, right? You can have the same frequency, you can have the same amplitude, but your phase can be shifted, right? And if your phase is shifted uh, perfectly, then your peaks and troughs will actually cancel out. And then you don't get anything. Uh, so if your phase is shifted to where peaks and troughs line up, and it's the same frequency and the same amplitude, uh, they're actually going to mathematically cancel, so you won't hear anything. So, yeah, you could do that, right? The next time you're in an argument with someone, right, try to say the exact same thing they're saying, uh, but say it just enough out of phase so that nobody hears anything. It really saved the rest of us a lot of trouble. It doesn't really, that's going to be impossible to do uh, for, for a variety of reasons, but, uh, you know, you can give it a try, right? All right, so that's your sort of simple sine wave story. The problem is uh, almost nothing you hear 
like out there in the world is going to be a simple sine wave. There are a few things that are going to be simple sine waves. We'll talk about those. We'll generate some of those. Um, on Thursday when we do the uh, sound localization, we're going to use what we call pure tones. Pure tones are just constructed of one sine wave frequency. Okay, That's all that's going to be in there. But everything else uh, is typically a bit more complex, right? So rather than just being sort of one simple sine wave, it's that sine wave uh, plus some sort of other sine wave. And in fact, there's, there's probably a, another sine wave in there as well, right? That's just a little different, okay? And that's going to create that complex, uh, that complex sound that you're going to hear. I've already talked to you just briefly about this Fourier analysis. I'm not going to ask you to really do a Fourier analysis, so don't get too freaked out about that, uh, because some people might have already like, whoa, what is this, right? Uh, but it's just a way that you can take this, this complex sine wave, or sound wave, right? This thing that you normally hear, and break it down into its components, right? So it's just kind of a way to deconstruct that, and it's a way to do that uh, mathematically. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is from a clarinet. Anybody ever played a clarinet? Anybody ever seen a clarinet? Yeah, right. They're awesome. Um, like I guess if you're Benny Goodman, right? That's the only clarinet player I know. Like, like that's like a famous clarinet player. Nobody knows Benny Goodman. That's disappointing. Uh, you should look that up. Like now. I mean, I mean, as a clarinet player. You don't know Benny. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. So minus one for all clarinet players. Benny Goodman. Right, because you weren't paying attention. I was too. That's why. You, just save that for later. I know, but I want you to look it up and then save it for later. So. We've got uh, a clarinet note here. It's up here at the top, right? Uh, your clarinet, for those of you that aren't familiar with the instrument, uh, it's like the long one, right? That's kind of usually black. It's got like a, a fluted end, but it's not a flute, right? I said, I want you to close what? Yeah, there's a reed. It's, it's definitely a woodwind, right? And it's got some buttons and levers and things that you, you know, do this to. Uh, I played the drums as well, so I know nothing about any other. You hit things as hard as you can, as quickly as you can, and it sounds great. Uh, it was really a lot of... I wanted to play the saxophone when I was like... So uh, this will tell you something about me, right? So I wanted to play the saxophone when I was in middle school, when I started in the band. Uh, for the one reason, one reason only. At that time, Bill Clinton was president, and he played, and he played the saxophone. And whatever you think about Bill Clinton, you've you got to realize, like, in the 90s, he was the coolest dude ever, right? Uh, like he was probably the, maybe up until three or four years ago, he was probably the coolest president we'd ever had, right? I mean, if you compare Bill Clinton to like Calvin Coolidge, it's a little comparison, right? And I thought, I'll play the saxophone. I couldn't read music. I didn't understand what those E's and F's were. It's like, I got to do something else. But I've already signed up for this class. Let's try something else. Maybe Jimmy Carter played the drums. I don't know. <laughs> It's not too late for him to learn, is it? Okay, he's still alive. He can still go for it. <clears throat> All right, so you're going to play the clarinet. <clears throat> the clarinet's a complex sound, right? It's a complex note, okay? I don't know what note this is. Uh, Taylor, what's your favorite clarinet note? A G. G, that's a note, right? Yeah. So this is going to be a G. You make it a small G or a big G? I don't know. It's a, it's a big G. Uh, so, this clarinet's playing a G, right? Uh, and we're going to say, like, what's a, what's a good clarinet level? Let's say it's like 100 decibels, right? That's pretty awesome. Okay. Uh, so, this clarinet's playing, doing whatever it's doing, right? Now, you see that that's a complex waveform, right? That is in no way, even with my horrible drawing, comparable to this, right? These two things don't look the same. Okay. The reason for that is, uh, that clarinet note, that G note, is, is not just carrying this main uh, frequency, right, of that G note, okay, which we would call the fundamental. Makes sense, right? 
if the note you're playing is a G, that fundamental frequency should be equal to a G, right? But there's other stuff on top of that, right? There are other little sine waves that are riding on top of that. And so if you look at this next sort of uh, band of the diagram, what we've done here is we've taken that complex G note from that clarinet and we've pulled out each individual sine wave component that makes up that complex note, right? And it's made up of two components. One is called the fundamental frequency. This frequency is the lowest frequency of that grouping, but it's also the highest amplitude, okay? Lowest frequency, highest amplitude, that equals your fundamental. We'll say that one more time and probably like 10 more times because I'm going to ask you this, right? This is important. Lowest frequency, now people are writing this down, Laura. Lowest frequency, highest amplitude, that's called your fundamental, okay? It's fundamental frequency. So if you're looking at this band, or this, uh, you know, that second graph here, well, which one's your fundamental frequency? Well, it's this one. Why? Highest amplitude, lowest frequency. How do I know it's the lowest frequency? How many peaks per second? Now, I'm not giving you a full second here, right? It's 0 .004 seconds, but whatever, right? Whichever sine wave, whichever wave here has the fewest peaks, that's the lowest frequency, right? And so it's clearly this component. <clears throat> All of the other sine waves that you need to create that G note from the clarinet, all of those are called harmonics. Okay? Just grouped together. All of them are harmonics. Okay? The cool thing about harmonics is they are actually uh, whole number multiples of that fundamental frequency. Okay? Whatever that fundamental frequency is, your harmonics have to be multiples of that, right? So let's say your uh, fundamental frequency is 2 hertz. That means your harmonics can be 4, 6, 8, 12, 152, <clears throat> right? They've all got to be multiples of 2, okay? If your fundamental frequency is 2 hertz, your harmonic can't be 7. Why? That's not a whole number multiple of 2, is it? Okay. Now, what if your fundamental frequency was 1.5 hertz? And we can measure things at half a hertz, right? Then you're looking at 3, 4.5, 6, 7.5. Those are possible harmonics, right? Okay. So while this is really fun to look at that you know, sine wave breakdown, right? We might want to plot this data in different ways. Right? And we might want to think about this in sort of a different format. So if we were to take and plot amplitude against frequency, okay? So we're going to take each of these harmonics and that fundamental. Across one axis, we're going to go, what's the frequency? On the other axis, we're going to say, hey, what's the amplitude? Okay? That'll show you the distribution of these components, right? Kind of show you the harmonics and the fundamental. Now if I'm looking at this, just this graph, just this plot here, which one of these dots represents my fundamental frequency? I've told you two things about the fundamental frequency. It's going to have the lowest frequency and the highest amplitude, right? So there's two ways you can identify this. You can go on this frequency side and go, hey, which one's got the lowest frequency? Well, it's this one. Or you can go on the amplitude and go, which one's got the highest amplitude? And you're like, oh, that's the same dot. Guess what that is? It's the fundamental. What are all the rest of the dots? Your harmonics. Okay? Don't worry too much about this other graph. They're just taking frequency and plotting it by uh, phase, right? So you can see some of these peaks and troughs, they don't line up. Again, on this uh, particular graph, you could pretty easily locate the uh, fundamental frequency. Again, we're looking for that one with the lowest 
frequency, right? We're not using amplitude information on either of these axes, so that information is not available to us. We can still identify that fundamental by that lowest frequency. All right. Questions about this? At some point over the next couple weeks, you're going to be doing something with harmonics and fundamentals. It's going to be a lab. Guess what that lab's called? The missing fundamental. <clears throat> yeah. <it's, laughs> there you go. Uh, it's going to be, what's interesting about this is, uh, and we'll talk more about this next week, we'll talk about the perception of sound, right? And how you would assume the perception of sound is probably based on that fundamental, right? If it carries such a high amplitude, it's got that low frequency, that's the sort of main characteristic of that sound. Uh, but what's interesting is you can cut that fundamental out and just play the harmonics and you'll still perceive uh, the same, I know, right? You'll still perceive the same pitch. It's really, it's really impressive. If it doesn't like wow you right now, that's fine. It's really going to wow you next Tuesday when I actually explain it in detail. It's one of many reasons for you to come back. Right, Laura? Great. You're doing a great Ed McMahon today. Nobody knows Ed McMahon but me, uh, but if you did, that'd be a great joke. Mm -hmm. just, just laugh like, it, like it's a wonderful joke, right? I can't even make an Andy Richter joke anymore. That's sad, too, on some level. I know, right? I know. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know what you want to do sometimes? You want to filter sound, right? Why not? Okay. So what you can do is you can take a sound, a, a sound wave, you can pipe it through some sort of filter, and then you're going to get something on the other end, right? Now the thing we need to think about when we think about a filter is filters do not add frequencies. And typically they, they remove frequencies. Uh, and whatever they do to one sine wave, they'll do something uh, sort of mathematically similar to every other sine wave. Right now, why am I spending all of this time talking to you about filters? Some of you are thinking, like, uh, anybody here an audiophile? I'm going to assume that's a no if you don't know what it is, right? How many of you? Uh, anybody have like? Uh, and most of you don't because you. How many of you walk around with like Bluetooth headphones? Yeah, that means you're not an audiophile. <clears throat> uh, real people use plugins. Uh, the sound quality ac across a Bluetooth signal is, whether you know it or not, is is less than what you get if you use like a, right Andrew? Uh, and so for an audio file, you're gonna have like a nice, uh, like a stereo set, right? And you're gonna, you're not just gonna get one of those little like postage stamp size things to play your music, right? It's gonna be something that's gonna take up half your bedroom. Uh, if you're really, right, because you're gonna have like all kinds of, uh, you know, amps and transformers and filters and so forth. <clears throat> and that's how we would think about this in some way. For those of you that are not audio files, you have another set of filters that we want to think about in a few minutes, right? It's your head, right? So the sound that comes in, it gets filtered. We'll talk about how it gets filtered by your outer ear, your inner ear. There are certain frequencies that just don't make it through, right? Uh, and we'll talk about how that works. But if this is a, a like a linear filter, we're not going to add things. We're just going to sort of take things out. And so if you do a uh, Fourier transform, much like we did before, where we took that complex uh, G note, right? And we plotted frequency and amplitude for each of the harmonics and the fundamental. We get a graph that looks just like this, okay? Nothing too complicated. After we pass it through the filter, we can do that same Fourier transform on this, right? We can pull out that same frequency and amplitude data. Uh, we're not adding data points, but we're losing some data points, right? And so if you look at this, you can find these sort of five data points, they're all right there, we lose some of that higher frequency data information, right? So we would use a fancy term here, and we would call this a low pass filter, right? Why would we call it low pass? Because it's passing the low frequencies, right? We would call it a high pass if it knocked out those lower frequencies and passed through the higher frequencies. That's a high pass. There's a third kind of filter, uh, that's called like a notch or a band pass. Okay. How does this work? There's some frequency range in the middle 
that, those are the frequencies that come through and anything above or below get filtered out, right? So that's why it's passing through just a band of frequencies, not above or below, just what's, what's kind of in between. Questions about that? Great. All right. So anything that transmits uh, sound, we can think about that as a filter, right? Again, we, we're going to think about the biological uh, components that you have of your, your auditory system, right? Uh, we're going to think about those as a filter. Uh, if we know, again, how a filter sort of changes or uh, passes a particular sine wave, we can predict what it's going to do on any sort of uh, complex sine wave or group of sine waves, right? So if we know what it's going to do to a simple sine wave, we know what it'll do to that, we can figure out what it'll do to this, <clears throat> right? It's going to be the same thing, okay? Don't worry too much about this, all right? Uh, basically, what we're doing here is we're just, this is uh, what's called a spectrogram. So again, we have that uh, clarinet, right, with some frequency, this time in kilohertz. So it's not 2 hertz, it's 2,000 hertz, right? Uh, a little more, uh, you know, works a little more for humans. What you see here is the, the darker the line is the, uh, the higher the amplitude <clears throat> in this particular case, right? And so we've got a little over half a second of, of sound for that particular note. And so what we notice is there are different frequency bands, okay? Interestingly, they're all sort of evenly spaced, which would indicate to you that they're all nice, even multiples of that fundamental frequency, okay? On this spectrogram, how would we identify the fundamental frequency? Any ideas? I mean, what do you know about the fundamental frequency? <clears throat> it's the lowest frequency, and it's the highest amplitude. So I'm going to look for the darkest, lowest line, right? Uh, well, hey, how about that? The lowest line is the darkest line. Makes that the fundamental. All the rest of these guys are harmonics. Okay. Questions about this? We're going to sort of shift over to some biological things. Now, I don't want you to forget this concept, right? I just kind of want to briefly introduce it now. We'll talk more about this idea next week, right? Because what we're going to do next week is we're going to talk about how these fundamentals and those frequencies, uh, those harmonics play a role uh, in the perception of sound. Right? All right, does that work for everybody so far? All right, <clears throat> let's talk about your outer ear. How many of you have a couple of those? Most, most people do, right? Uh, typically, when you think about your outer ear, what do you think it's good for? Uh, it's good for sticking stuff in or uh, holding stuff on, right? So you think about like earrings and glasses, right? and that's usually what you think of for your inner ear or your outer ear, right? You don't really think it actually does a lot of great uh, things for you. In fact, uh, your outer ear is probably one of the most overlooked uh, components of your auditory system, right? I'm going to tell you something interesting here in a few moments but I'm gonna to have to really catch my breath and I'm gonna to have to yell it at you uh, because you're all gonna go deaf uh, much sooner than I am. And the reason you're gonna go deaf before I am, and I know this, is uh, most of you, how many of you use earbuds? Yeah. <clears throat> For those of them, Taylor, who use the earbuds too much, how many of you use earbuds? Okay, the problem with an earbud, you guys know where this goes, right? It goes straight in the ear. What's it bypass? It bypasses your outer ear, right? That's a bad thing, okay? It's a bad thing to bypass your outer ear. Your outer ear, and it took us millennia to develop these, they're there for a reason, right? They help you when it comes to focusing sound waves. They help you when it comes to attenuating uh, high frequencies in particular, right? <clears throat> Which is really great. The first uh, frequencies of sound that you're going to lose as you get older are high frequencies. Okay, so you're going to lose those guys first. So you want some um, some help with those. It really amplifies these uh, sort of medium sound frequencies, that 1500 to 7000 hertz. Anybody have an idea of 
<clears throat> like a normal sound that you hear every day that falls somewhere between 1500 and 7000 hertz in terms of frequency like probably what's the most important thing you hear every single day your alarm uh, <clears throat> human speech no you don't think human speech is that important right <clears throat> not important at all human speech is typically in that uh, you know 1500 to 7000 Hertz range so it makes a lot of sense that our outer ear would be shaped in such a way to amplify those frequencies so we can best hear those right because that's a great way that we communicate uh, and deliver information again we're going to sort of attenuate those higher frequencies <clears throat> because we want to reduce damage to our cochlea. We'll talk about uh, the cochlea, cochlea later and how those higher frequency sections get damaged more easily, right? So we would want to reduce those higher frequency sounds. How many of you love like uh, like real high frequency just, I know, right? Like Aspen's already, like I didn't even try to make the sound and you're just, because that's what it makes you do, right? We don't like high frequency sounds, okay? They're typically used for alarms, right? Uh, because they're alerts. They're 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 uh, they're something that you would use if you were in a danger situation, right? So, outer ear is important. Stop using earbuds. That's what I always say. But none of you are going to listen to me. Uh, those of you that can listen to me, you're going to ignore me. Those of you, some of you can't hear me anyway uh, at this point. So I always use over the ear headphones. Even though they look ridiculous sometimes, uh, over the ears, the way to go, right? <clears throat> Do you want to look really ridiculous? There's a pair that has cat ears on the top of, of like on the band. Well, there you go, right? That's the way to go. <clears throat> so don't use earbuds. I don't have any like um, uh, financial connections to, to over the ear headphone manufacturers. I always want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but. I've been telling people this for years, Laura. I know, I know, right? I know you have. And then finally, after I'd been telling people two or three years about this, like this is a bad idea, there was an article in the New York Times about it, uh, about how like they're seeing younger folks losing their hearing at, a, at, a, at, at earlier and earlier ages, because you guys are just cramming that stuff in there, right? Just... <laughs> I'm just waiting on like the ghost of Steve Jobs to create the uh, like, eye hearing aid uh, and I think that's I feel like they're probably doing it on like his big master plan probably included making everyone go deaf so they would have to buy hearing aids from Apple well, the hard thing he has is credit cards <clears throat> my dad has one it's like made of titanium really well there you go we have Amazon card cards like you can rig out a wall and it like actually penetrated the wall one time it's scary it's like a ninja sword so, <clears throat> it pays bills well there you go if your card gets rejected <laughs> <laughs> you, can always, you can always use it to hold up the place, right? Give me my coffee. I always imagine it's going to happen at a Starbucks. Is that, that seems accurate, right? That's, that's what I think about Starbucks drinkers. Yeah. Questions about that? Does anybody need me to repeat that louder? Actually, I'm just Uh... No, I actually, not in this class, but in another course I taught, uh, I, I had a, um, a student who had some hearing difficulties and she would sit in the front and try to like pay attention to what I was saying. And I would just constantly see her asking the person who sit, was sitting next to her, did he just say that? Uh, and most of the time, yeah, that's what I just said. But she like didn't believe that I'd said whatever I had said because it sounded ridiculous. <laughs> constantly second guessing what she thought I said. All right, outer ear, uh, very important. Don't ignore it. Don't just hang things on it, right? Uh, use it for stuff, <clears throat> okay? How many of you have ever uh, tilted your head when you're trying to locate where sound is coming from, right? Ever wonder why you do that? It changes the position of your outer ear relative to the sound source, and you get a different um, attenuation of that sound, right? Because you're catching those sound waves differently, and then you can... Um, you know, you can better locate that. We'll talk about sound localization on Thursday. They'll do a lot of sound localization, right? Also, cochlear implants, kind of interesting, uh, bypass the outer ear completely, right? And for those of you, we'll talk about cochlear implants at some point. All right, what about the middle ear? 
right? You've moved past that outer ear, you're into the middle ear. This includes your auditory ossicles, right? Those uh, ear bones, right? You've got three of those. They're kind of exciting. And what we call the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Why do you have these bones in your middle ear? Well, what, what's their purpose? How many of you have ever taken a rock and skipped it across the surface of water? Right? How many of you have ever jumped into water uh, from something that wasn't water? Like air, right? <clears> That's <throat> how that usually works. It, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant transition, typically, right? Okay? It's not a smooth transition. Why? Uh, water has a higher density than air. Okay? And as you're coming from air into water, uh, you can, if you come in at the wrong angle, you can skip off of that, right? Like a rock. Uh, or if you hit it straight on, it's, you know, it's kind of unpleasant, right? Which makes, um, if, if any of you watch uh, like, uh, you know, uh, Olympic divers, it makes that really impressive when they, they go in and they don't make a big splash, right? That's why that's so impressive because they break through the surface of the water. Well, your inner ear, which we'll talk about in a few moments, <clears throat> is filled with something called endolymph. How many of you remember last week we talked about the vestibular system? We talked about endolymph then as well, right? It's the same s substance here, right? It's this kind of jelly, okay? Jelly uh, doesn't have the same sort of density as air. So if you go straight from air to jelly, guess what could happen? All of those sound waves that are coming in could bounce right off, okay? So the sound waves that are coming in your ear that you need to transmit into the rest of your auditory system, they just get reflected back out and none of that energy gets transferred. Okay? If that energy doesn't get transferred, your um, inner hair cells, those cells in your cochlea that we'll talk about later, they don't, um, they don't vibrate. And if they don't vibrate, you don't perceive that sound. Right? So if all that sound waves are just bouncing off, you're not getting any of that information. So what do your um, auditory ossicles do? They help, uh, they help with that process, right? So they help going from that uh, air to you know, that gelatinous substance, right? They act as these mechanical levers. And so they amplify the force of those sound waves coming in. They have to amplify it because it has to have more force behind it once it gets into the fluid, right? So how many of you um, have ever tried to run through air? Okay, let's think running through air is your baseline speed, right? Uh, and then let's try to run through water. How many of you can run as fast through water as you can through air? Like no one, right? Okay, and you have to put more, even if you could, you'd have to exert more force to do that, right? Because it requires more force to get through that denser material. It requires more force for these sound waves to travel through the endolymph than it does through the air. So you have to have those auditory ossicles there to um, amplify amplify that signal. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool, right? All right, so once we have amplified that signal, <clears throat> we are now into the inner ear, right? We've had that uh, sound wave come in through your outer ear, it's that tympanic membrane, causes those auditory ossicles to vibrate. Those vibrations have been amplified. We're going to start beating around on the cochlea, right? So that we can transmit <clears throat> these uh, vibrational waves through the cochlea, through that uh, uh, endolymph. Okay? Your cochlea sort of looks like a snail. It's curled up. We're going to think about it uh, uncurled, though, <clears throat> so that we can sort of think about the organization of that cochlea. Okay. As the sound waves travel through this endolymph, okay, we're going to travel through that fluid all along the cochlea. Okay. What's interesting is the way the cochlea is designed and the way that the inner hair cells are plugged in here, whichever frequency is coming in, 
right, is going to have sort of a um, it's going to have a location where it causes the biggest vibration, right? And that's going to be because the frequency of the of the sound wave coming in matches, right, sort of the 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 resonance of the cochlea, right? structure of the cochlea. So if we look at the uh, the cochlea here, <clears throat> right, this has been unrolled. Normally, it's again, it's that uh, sort of snail thing, right? And we have something called <clears throat> uh, the base and the apex, right? Okay. Uh, near the uh, what we call the base, it's going to be um, sort of stiff and narrow, right? Okay. This is going to be more sensitive to higher frequency sounds, right? <clears throat> You're going to get maximal movement. In the uh, in this location, uh, for those higher frequencies near the area we call the apex, it's going to be wide <clears throat> and flexible. So these lower frequencies are going to cause a bigger displacement. Okay. This is one of the reasons why you have um, high loss of high frequency uh, hearing as you get older. If you think about this this uh, part that's stiff and narrow, it's easier to damage, right? <clears throat> so if you think about, uh, let's take a, a potato chip and a cooked spaghetti noodle, right? And if you try to try to vibrate a potato chip, what happens to it? It's probably going to shatter, right? It's going to break. If you try to vibrate a, what, you know, a cooked spaghetti noodle, it just kind of flops, right? Uh, because it's, it's going to be uh, more flexible. So there we go. This is uh, potato chips. And this is cooked spaghetti. <clears throat> and it's because of potato chips that you lose high frequency hearing when you get older. This is why you'll see sometimes, um, <clears throat> uh, I know this was a, it was a security procedure that, that uh, in particular Walmart used a number of years ago. They may still do this, I don't know. In their shoe section in particular, why their shoe section, I don't know. Uh, they'll at night play high frequency noises to, to keep away young people uh, because it's annoying. So that, that the really old folks can at four in the morning, I guess, shop for shoes uh, without being disturbed. Uh, it, it's actually, a, 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 apparently, I don't know, there was a, for a while, young folks would come in and they would steal shoes at night from Walmart. Uh, and so they would play this like high frequency noise that only younger folks could hear. So that way older folks could go in and buy their things. Uh, you'll see this sometimes with uh, people who will turn up their notification uh, sound. They'll have these high frequency notifications on their phones, right? Uh, in hopes that they're like, you know, decrepit teachers and so forth can't hear them. Uh, and you can, you know, some of you may have been part of that in the past, I don't know. It's not going to work for you going forward because, again, you're all losing your hearing fast. <clears throat> Good luck with that. All right, so we've got that uh, fluid displacement. As we said, it's a wave. Uh, it peaks at a particular location in the cochlea. The cells in that region, these inner hair cells we'll talk about later, they have those cilia just like the hair cells in the uh, vestibular system, and they get deflected. And they go, oh, okay, because we are at this location, we know we're sensitive to 2,000 hertz. If we were in another location, we would be sensitive to 3,000 hertz, right, whatever that is. It's called a frequency to place code. Okay. <clears throat> the frequency specifically activates a certain place because we know the arrangement of the frequencies along the cochlea, we know which frequency uh, uh, sound wave is coming in based on the location of the uh, cells that are activated where they have that biggest displacement. <clears throat> Don't worry about that. There's that frequency to place conversion that we just talked about. Okay. All right. So again, Right? 
The cochlea has a has variation in how uh, stiff that is going through the cochlea, right? And that change in stiffness is uh, it's gradual and it's in one direction, right? It doesn't uh, it doesn't go back and forth. It's all continuous in one direction, right? <clears throat> and so we have those high frequencies again near the base and the low frequencies near what we call the apex, okay? Questions about that? We'll talk about this again. This is actually sort of an important concept. This arrangement of low frequencies to high frequencies will be replicated in your auditory cortex, okay? So we think, we'll think about that. All right, your uh, inner hair cells. These guys are embedded in the, uh, what we call the basilar membrane. It's part of the cochlea. These have almost an identical structure to those hair cells that we talked about in the vestibular system. Remember, in the vestibular system, we said that fluid moves, right? We have those ear stones, the otoliths, that come along and they cause those deflections. This is a little different story. The vibrations uh, of the, the sound wave coming in causes movement of that basilar membrane, right? Wherever that is along that frequency to place code sort of thinking. And the hair cells there, they get uh, sort of shaken up the most. So their uh, cilia are displaced and then we know which frequency is coming in. Okay? You have another group of cells called the outer hair cells. <clears throat> These guys play an interesting role, uh, particularly in something we call gain control. We'll talk a bit more about this later. But this, this is sort of handling information coming back down, right? So if you think about your sensory capabilities, they, they actually cover a rather broad range, right? You can hear a broad range of frequencies. The problem is at any given moment, though, you're probably listening to a very narrow band of frequencies, right? And so in fact, you should try to tune your auditory system to that frequency band, right? So you can extract the most information from there and sort of ignore the other frequency bands because you're not getting information coming in there, right? <clears throat> so this is very similar to your, um, if you think about the way like a, uh, like a television works, right? How many channels can you get on your television? Uh, let's say you get 100 channels, right? I don't want to make up a number. All 100 of those are actually coming to you at any given moment, right? Uh, for those of you that have cable, those 100 channels are coming in at the same time, right? Uh, the job of your uh, tuner is to select that narrow range for, you know, that one channel so you guys can watch Mari Povich or whatever it is you do with your time when you're not, you're not here. The Bachelor, that's even worse. Uh, <clears throat> at least they, I won't say that. <laughs> I was going to say something and I thought that's probably not a good thing to say. I'll just leave it there. Um, so, your outer hair cells are helping tune those inner hair cells, right? So that you have most of your attention, most of your resources focused on a particular frequency range. Okay. I think I remember some time when I mentioned this frequency to place code. Has anybody anybody heard me talk about that before? I know it's on like five slides for a reason. This is important. This is exactly how your auditory system works, right? You have a cochlea arranged from low to high frequencies. Sound waves come in. They cause some maximal displacement somewhere along that basilar membrane in the cochlea based on their frequency and the sort of native resonance of that basilar membrane, right? Like how easily does it vibrate at that frequency? Those hair cells, they have those little cilia, they get deflected and they send a signal up to your brain that says, whoa, I'm hearing 5,000 hertz. There you go. It's that simple. That's not so bad, right? Okay. Now the problem with this is, as we'll learn later, uh, just because you hear a frequency of 5,000 hertz doesn't mean you know what that is, right? So right now you can just go, oh, that was 5,000 hertz. It's not terribly helpful, right? Uh, was that 5,000 hertz coming from a car that's about to hit me? Uh, was that 5,000 hertz coming from 
um, you know, somebody across the street who's handing out, I don't know, free hot dogs, you know, different, I, I don't know, different things, right? It happens. <clears throat> All right, uh, we also want to think about coding intensity. Again, this is um, thinking about the amplitude, right? Typically, you can hear a range of about 100 decibels, okay? Uh, but each nerve fiber really can only, is only sensitive to about half of that, right? So some nerve fibers are sensitive to uh, higher intensities and some to lower, right? And so we sort of have a couple uh, nerve fibers for, for each sort of frequency, right? Because you can have a higher or low frequency and you can have each of those at a higher or low intensity, right? Those are two separate things. Amplitude and frequency are independent of each other, okay? <clears throat> Once you get past the cochlea, the auditory system, like in the rest of your central nervous system, is pretty confusing. There's a lot of information that's crisscrossing. There's a lot of information that's going to more than one location. Okay, And there's a reason for this and a reason we want to think about. I'm not going to ask you <clears throat> to memorize this diagram, right? Because information coming into your left ear Right? Some of it goes over to the right side in a couple places. Some of it comes up to the same left side. These pathways are confusing in some sense. They're very ordered, right? but there's a lot of information there. Okay? The reason that we have information coming in and we're crossing that information over and we're comparing that information from one side to the other is that even when a sound source is completely on one side of you. You hear it with both ears, right? Okay. Uh, so for those of you <clears throat> who are um, on the other side of me, three or four of you right here, this might not work. You could actually put your finger in your um, ear closest to me and you could still hear what I'm saying, right? That's not because the sound is traveling necessarily past you and reflecting back, although that is happening to some degree. But it's because the sound wave is still coming through, right? It's still causing some vibrations, okay, in your other ear. <clears throat> if you sort of unplug both ears, what's interesting about this is you can compare the information that's coming into your left ear to the information that's coming into your right ear. And based on that information, that comparison, you can actually determine a lot of information about where something is located, right? <clears throat> One of the most important things you can do uh, is determine where something is, where a sound is coming from, right? How many of you have heard a car? Yeah. Where that car is is important, right? The location of that car. You know, you just going to go, oh man, that's a car. <sighs> well, great, but that doesn't help you in any way, right? So, so you can identify a car, but is the car coming at you? If it is coming at you, from which direction? How quickly is it coming at you, right? <clears throat> that's all information that you can get by comparing information from the left and the right ears. Okay. Later we'll talk about um, how some of that works because on Thursday uh, we're going to do a lab activity where we are going to uh, use that difference in information and we're going to determine where things are located. Right? We're going to do some sound localization. So you're going to have to trust your group members because one of you is going to be blindfolded. <clears throat> I know, right? That's taking a lot of trust. Uh, but it's okay. It's okay. Uh, no stabbing this week. I know last week was a stab week, uh, but no stabbing, right? I'd hope not. At least not blindfolded. But that's the best time to stab someone. They don't know who did it. Not when you're blindfolded. <clears throat> well, we'll see. Uh, so here we go. Huh. You've just recovered from your uh, clarinet comments. Good job. <laughs> Sound localization to, to know where to stab. Now we're getting to a good activity. All right, so there are two things that we might uh, do, two, two bits of information that we can get between left ear and right ear. Uh, and we call these intraoral. That just means between the two ears. Okay, I know that's a fancy word. It just means between the two ears. There's what we call a time difference. Okay, 
How many of you realize that your head has some width to it? Yeah, uh, and that puts your ears some distance apart, right? And if a sound source is coming from your left or your right, and it gets to your close ear first, there's, even though your head's not you know, that big, it takes a little bit of time for that sound to get to the other ear, right? And so we can compare, it's gonna be milliseconds, but we can compare that time difference. And based on that time difference, we can determine how far away from the midline something is from you, right? <clears throat> so if you think about something directly in front of you, that sound source, that sound is going to reach both ears at the same time, right? Because it's the same distance, because it's directly in front of you. As we move that farther to one side, right, it gets farther from one ear closer to the other, right? <clears throat> and that time difference changes from left ear to right ear, and we can determine where that is sort of in an angular way. That works for a certain set of frequencies. We'll talk about that later. Uh, for those other frequencies, we have to use what are called interaural level differences. <clears throat> One of the cool things about sound uh, is sound waves, they, they decrease over distance, right? So for those of you who are sitting very close to me, you're getting this really like intense sound. For those of you that are farther back, uh, it's, it's decreased some, right? <clears throat> that may be why you're sitting in the back. It may also be because you want to play Angry Birds. It's up to you, right? So you, <clears throat> you're, you're farther away. I think if they're not paying attention in class, they're wasting their time, and Angry Birds is a waste of time. Can't think of anything worse other than watching Mario or The Bachelor. Uh, so we'll put all those three things together. How many of you do watch The Bachelor? Anybody going to own up to that now? Nobody? Like one person's brave enough, but you're also a Cleveland fan. So you have, yeah. I, I mean, there's like no no shame, right? So you're just like, ah, whatever. So once you're a Cleveland fan and you admit it, all shame's gone. Is that accurate? I know. Just when I thought Cleveland fans couldn't learn. <laughs> I, I know. Like a win or two once in a while. <clears throat> once in a while. So we'll use these level differences, right? Because your two ears are some distance apart, if that sound source is off to one side, uh, when it hits your second ear, the farther ear, the amplitude is going to have decreased a little bit, right? And so you can compare that difference as well. Questions about that? We're actually going to, again, we're going to practice this on Thursday, right? It's going to be exciting. All right. Auditory cortex, once information gets passed, uh, this whole sort of mess of business, we get up to the auditory cortex, kind of right there by your ear, which is kind of nice, right? It's close, you know where it is. Uh, there are other sort of secondary areas that go around primary auditory cortex, which is interesting. Uh, the cool thing is auditory cortex is mapped tonotopically. Who remembers that time I talked about frequency to place code, right? And I said, the cochlea is organized in an orderly fashion from high to low frequency, right? Guess what? We take that same organizational pattern and we put it into your primary auditory cortex. We've kind of pulled it out of here and we go from low frequency to high frequency. It does, once you go to a new auditory area, things are mirrored. It's kind of an interesting concept in cortexes maps that are next to each other are actually mirrored images of the maps, but they're a little distorted, right? So you don't go high to low and then start over high to low. You go high to low, low to high, high to low, right? If you're going to make uh, maps that are next to each other, it kind, of, kind of folds up. Well, there you go. We're back. <clears throat> Took a brief moment. Message from our sponsor. There's no one. All right. Questions about this? We still have that what and where pathway business. You guys remember when I said dorsal versus ventral uh, pathways? And I said this is actually going to be something that's going to apply to just about all the sensory systems that we talk about. Well, same story here, right? We have the where on the dorsal side, and we have what on the ventral side. So where is going to be location? And what is obviously identification. All right. 
We also have what's called a descending auditory pathway. So once we get that information into our auditory cortex, we're going to send information back down to the cochlea. In particular, uh, we're going to send those down to the, remember those outer hair cells that we said were involved in gain control? Okay. We're going to send that information back down. We're going to go, hey, you know, I've not really heard anything in my upper frequency range in a while. Probably don't need to tune my resources to that. Let me just tune it to these mid frequencies, right? And then all of a sudden you go, like, whoa, what was that high frequency? Well, maybe I need to readjust, right? And so you're constantly adjusting uh, where your um, auditory resources are going based on uh, the information that's coming in and then the information that's coming back down. And you think, doesn't that sound like a really slow process? Well, in some sense it does. Uh, but when you realize that um, one of your brain cells can send a signal to another brain cell on the order of about two milliseconds, right? Uh, that's, that's actually pretty fast. Okay, so even if we're figuring we have to go through uh, 10 or 12 synapses, right? 10 or 12 signals, we're, we're still only talking about maybe, you know, 25 to 50 milliseconds, right? So this information that we're getting in, we can constantly be evaluating that, averaging that, and sending back down a signal that says, hey, adjust up or down, okay? So that way we're not wasting our time uh, adjusting else, uh, you know, focusing our resources elsewhere. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Any questions about this? Comments, concerns? All right. Well, I would like to stop there for today. Thursday.